Most of my writings are untitled documents. They begin with nothing, and that nothingness becomes something. When news of the pandemic hit, I remember joking about it and hoping that we'd get time off from school. I also remember being grounded for the first month and a half, so I was excited that in my time off, I'd just get to sleep in and sit on my PC all day and night. I also remember when I was ungrounded, I still couldn't do anything. I think it was then, at some point during that series of moments, that I realized I would never see these people again. Not in the same way. Not during class. Football games. The news of her first death came, and I began to wonder what might happen. Soon, schools began to close, and it was supposed to close for two weeks. Then it became a month, and soon, indefinitely. To be honest, I every now and then forget that we're living in a pandemic. As a homebody, I like being home, so spending days at home wasn't that much of a lifestyle change. But the more time I spent at home, the more suffocated and confined I felt. When the school decided it was too dangerous to continue working in the school together, we started to separate ourselves and make our films separately. But I wasn't afraid of this change, no. But then it was time to graduate from school. I wish I could have celebrated with the people I earned that knowledge with, that taught me what I learned. That's when I realized that this pandemic would change my life forever. I guess when lockdown started and they said that it would go on until at least the end of April, I had known about the uh, pandemic arc since a bit before it actually started in full because the teacher running TCG Club was worried about it. 
We all thought he was just freaking out, but nah, it was a real thing. I have yet to realize how much this global pandemic has changed my life. I guess we'll see when things go back to normal, if they do, that is. But I have definitely found more worth in myself. I've gotten time to reflect on my past. The times where I fought, I didn't have to, and the times I needed to fight, I didn't. I've always seemed to stand up for other people, as I should, but I never seem to stand up for myself, and nobody has ever stood up for me. There are people who have called me a friend, and I call a friend, but the difference is, I meant it. I learned that I can't change the past, but I can change the future. I knew the global pandemic changed my life when I could no longer interact or visit my loved ones. On my routine trips to the market one Tuesday, I caught the train, addressed by silence, and went about my business, off the train and onto the market. While I passed by the familiar alleys, signs like keep six feet apart, wear a mask, and hand sanitizers were a motif. It felt as though I was in a field of dead tulips, and for the first time in a while, I sense the universal language of the world dry out. I started to realize how much I needed to get out of the house. I started missing class and human connection that was with anybody but the people that I was stuck with. I was trapped in an overcrowded house with the paranoid and violent drunk that I'm expected to call my father. Nightly, he'd come into my room and talk at me for hours about the same fucked up philosophies and warped worldviews that he sees through. Racist ideas, nihilistic, sexist, anti-Semitic, paranoid, and depressive delusions. Weeks turned to months. And it wasn't until the summer came that I started to realize that this was life now. Trying to talk to people through a screen, suffering in the silence of the lonely dark, kept up for hours long lectures about how everybody else is stupid and they just don't understand. I've seen him berate his own mother damn near hit her with a broom, and I've heard stories, violent stories, about beatings that he's dealt out and been dealt himself. And when he was drunk enough, he burst into my room with that look of disgust and anger. I would never hurt you. I j I see so much of myself in you. I'm just worried that if I don't do something, then you're going to end up just like me. Flinching at every quick motion preparing for a strike that never came, constantly on edge, on the verge of tears. These confrontations could start anywhere between 8 or 11 p.m. and go until 4 o'clock in the morning. And all I could do was sit there and nod and agree and pray that he'd finish soon, or apologize and apologize, and try to explain myself for something that I had nothing to do with. He made it impossible to trust anyone. His mental gymnastics to always be right, or always be the smartest one, his paranoid, liquor or drug-fueled delusions, his lies, betrayals, 
they all made it impossible to trust anything. Impossible to discern fact from fabrication. Furthering my spiral into a world of isolation and fear, I can't trust my memory anymore. And it's hell. It was my graduation day. I remember sitting on the couch with my cap and gown on. I was dressed up all fancy, even wearing a little bit of makeup. It honestly felt silly getting all dressed up just to sit in my living room like every other day. My dad was in his recliner and my mom in her favorite chair. And my sister was on the couch next to me, but she was only half paying attention. We couldn't get the video to work at first, so we joined a little bit late. We listened to all the speeches and every time someone new popped up onto the screen, my mom would say, honey, do you know her? Or what's his name? I watched the list of names for the various awards, carefully scanning the names and texting a congratulations to anyone I recognized. And then the big moment arrived, the announcement of all the names. It took a while. Franklin is such a big school, so I think there were around 300 of us graduating. I watched each name and picture flash up onto the screen. So many names and faces people I had practically forgotten about. It brought back memories of passing by teachers in the hall, chatting with friends during class, or even just recognizing someone I used to talk to when I was a freshman. Remembering each of these small, insignificant moments made me sad. It was sinking in that high school is really over. I spent so many hours at that school. It was my life, my identity, family. And now it's gone with no warning. Before I even knew it, it disappeared overnight. <laughs> over the months leading up to that day, a small part of me hoped the universe would snap its fingers and everything would return to exactly how it was before the shutdown. I would be sitting in my AP calculus class, complaining about the difficult homework problems. But on this day, reality finally set in. My life, everyone's life, was still moving forward. We would all be going our separate ways, even though for months, everything felt still. Time doesn't stop, not even for a global pandemic. Emails, texts and phone calls were coming in saying that many events I was supposed to work at were going to be postponed, but that soon became canceled. It had only been the first few weeks of the state mandated lockdown no one was allowed to leave unless they had a very good reason to. So I sat at home reading emails over and over again. We have no choice but to cancel during these unprecedented times. Know that we hope for you these times will be over, but more importantly, that you and your loved ones are staying home and staying healthy. The world had stopped and my year was canceled. All I could do was whatever housework and schoolwork I had. But when I was done with housework and done with schoolwork, I sat at home, thinking about the places and events I would be at. I remember the first show I helped out on. I would hit play in the computer to ensure that the music cues were on time. I loved everything about it. Being in a dark place, working with people as a team, seeing the audience enjoy what's happening on stage and just the roar of people. Had it not been, for that day, I was being taught what the different cables did in that green and tan proscenium theater. I would 
probably still be stuck wondering what it'd be like behind stage. I found myself missing the crowd's applause I would typically hear when an artist was done performing. Honestly, I don't think I can tell other people's stories for them. But oh dear God, I do not want to tell my own story anymore. I am so sick of myself. I'm, I'm so sick of living in my own head. Please just let me leave. I am running multiple stories where multiple people are either representative of or actually are different versions of myself. I've been running a story since seventh or eighth grade where basically every character native to it is a blatant self-insert. I'm better at writing characters when they've got aspects of me but are also solidly not me, like Amaya Madani or Violet Foster Chang. I knew the global pandemic changed my life when I could no longer visit or interact with my loved ones. Last spring, I celebrated my 20th in my garage with a huge cheesecake. I was sad that my people were no longer a planner away or arm's length away. The seas, walls, and continents away. Locking eyes with loved ones turned to lockdowns. Empty roads I go, nobody to vent to. I felt more isolated in a society that didn't welcome me. And yet, I missed it. And strangers, strangers were no longer memorable. There were masks just getting by. And her smile, her smile lingered in a distant memory. One I can no longer rely on. You know, I miss when I could dance, hug, and kiss without reason. It took time again to lose something, to value its gain. I wish to grieve until I understand fully that even though I wish to have made the poet's choice, I made the lover's choice. I learned that surely death does not hesitate and life has always been beautiful until we attach its beauty to beings we love. And when they are no longer here, I find myself slipping away to my left and right hemisphere of my brilliantly sculpted mind, wondering how is it so? If only I knew with certainty, that's the last time I would gaze or glance at someone or something I loved. I would make the poet's choice. I haven't seen anyone outside of family members in a very long time. I know it's for the safety of others and myself, so I respect it. But it's still hard not being able to see people I care about in a year. It's been hard hearing the struggles of my family overseas and not being able to do anything about it, let alone leave my own house. My anxiety has been a piece of shit since quarantine. As a daydreamer, I disassociate a bit. Just daydreaming of a future where COVID didn't exist or just random other things as a means to cope. Next year, I should be graduating and it may be selfish of me, but I really want an in-person ceremony. I guess I really care about things that probably aren't necessary. I've done a blank. I've sort of just been living. 
every day is the same, if not worse. I try to take one step forward, but it's seen as a nudge. But I know in me that I'm doing the best that I can, but doing the best that you can is always seen as your best. I just can't wait till some of these stresses are gone. There will be new ones, but at least it'll be something new. So I was going to an art school for making film. You know, making moving pictures was and still is a big dream of mine. Uh, but when they said that we, that was too dangerous to keep working at the school together, you know, we had to separate and, you know, make our film separately. No, oh, but I wasn't afraid of this change, no. Uh, no, I continued learning, you know, about others still around me and, yeah, about myself. You know, instead of asking friends if they wanted to go out somewhere, and I would just see if they wanted to talk for a little while. You know, instead of working on my career next to friends, you know, I, would, uh, I would just give them a call and uh, do my work as we talk. I think that Things changing in our lives is a difficult and yet scary thing for a lot of us. I mean, it definitely is for me. But I don't know, I'm, I'm starting to realize little by little how change is the most necessary thing to be accepting of. I think what helped me realize that change is necessary is the way that I make my art. You know, I like to be comfortable, you know, not really like to move around from place to place. But I think that because of this, uh, I don't have too many friend groups that are also artists. And the only way to improve on that is to change, you know, to go to new places, see new people, uh, talk to new people. And I know that might be some time before I get to see my friends again, but I don't know. I think that if I'm willing to accept the change happening around me rather than oh, looking back on what I had, maybe the wait won't feel as long. And I was confident that things would go back to the way they were in you know, a couple months. And everyone around me was telling me this, everyone. But soon the weather started to get warmer and summer came a lot sooner than we thought. Not far from our school is Westwood Village, which is just a shopping center, and in Westwood, there's a teriyaki shop that my friends and I go to called Toshi's. We initially went there just to grab some lunch and get some fresh air off campus, but as time went on, it became our sort of safe space. At Toshi's, we could get away from the stress of life and confined in each other while eating great food. I've spent my whole life in this community south end of Seattle, Brainier Beach. I can't imagine calling anywhere else my home. Spent the last few years trying to give back to the people here through my work, dedication, and yeah, my art. It was a lonely, lonely summer for me. Just like it probably was for most. I spent almost all my time working, hardly saw friends, and I never went swimming. And I freaking love swimming. 
My mom was convinced COVID was more transferable in the water. So I played it safe. I would go and hang out with a small group of friends at the garden, our safe place by the school. Sometimes there were two of us, sometimes there were five or six, but most of the time it was a safe three to four. Every day, or every other day, we gather and talk and create. It was nice. The garden slowly became a less welcoming environment. People were littering and breaking things. There were two times where I had to pull our picnic table out of the creek. And after the second time, they started tearing it apart until there was nothing but memories and wood planks. Totally destroying the safest place we all had as a group. Sometimes I went by myself, but most of the time I would be accompanied by my best friends, Bubba and Jojo. They would talk to me and listen to my issues, but they were mainly there just as companions that I felt safe and happy with. When the restaurant was too crowded, we would just take the food and head to the bleaches at the field farthest away from the school and spend time together there. There were a few times we were almost caught, but I guess that was just a short thrill that also came with the teriyaki. As time passed, we called it our teriyaki and therapy. Isolation. I started with isolation by choice and then turned into enforced isolation. Somewhere down the line, my mental stability couldn't register the fact that I couldn't see my family and friends for my safety and theirs. I remember being out for the first time in a while during what felt like a very hot morning. I was going to the Safeway. It was nice to be out despite an unusually hot morning. I ran into a friend that day and we went to the Safeway together. We talked about how our families were taking the lockdown what we'd been doing during the lockdown, and what we'd learned. But we mostly talked about the things that we missed, going out to places with friends, the concerts you wanted to go to, and the people who we'd lost touch with during the lockdown. We walked around the store with a new caution I thought I wouldn't need to have. Watching the people around me to make sure that they wore their masks correctly and that there was a six feet distance with anyone else around me. I wasn't the only one as I noticed other people doing the same. On her walk to her ways home, she mentioned how a man was killed by police yesterday. I thought to myself, really? Even during a pandemic, they are still doing this. She told me how there were protests happening and how Seattle was planning their own. But I remember that this is nothing new at this time. I had already heard stories about the Asian community that was already facing an increase in racism during this time though it felt like there was more than usual everywhere. I felt fear for my friends, because I have many friends who are people of color, and I knew that this would only make the already rampant issue worse. It already felt like all we were doing at this point was fighting. Things with my dad got progressively worse. Everyone always walking on eggshells around him and my grandpa. Somehow my grandpa was the only one who didn't know that he was still drinking. And each one of us were either too scared or too uncomfortable to tell him the truth. So instead, my mom would take us out to my grandparents' cabin. About an hour and a half drive away, private but not secluded, safe and relaxing. This was most of July and would continue on and off for the rest of the summer. Out there, we'd cook up steaks, have fires, do some fishing, go kayaking. And shoot at empty cans with pellet guns. <clears throat> but the best part, come bedtime, I got the entire living room to myself. Fireplace, TV, kitchen, and deck access. 
I still see it as one of my last remaining physically safe places. My favorite thing to do was to go out into the center of the lake on a kayak. Waterproof speaker strapped in, playing music I could vibe to. As I just lay out there for hours. Sleeping peacefully out on the water, undisturbed. I could have stayed there forever. But like all good things, the time came where the weekend or week away came to a close, and we had to go back. I landed an amazing internship that summer. Only five people from Washington State were chosen. It was eight weeks total working hands-on with a local nonprofit. And the best part, it included a fully covered week-long trip to Washington, D.C., where I got to meet all the national participants. I was beyond excited. Except none of that ever happened. It got modified to a six-week virtual learning program with no DC trip and limited online nonprofit work. By week two, it just felt like school again. They scheduled us full, with sometimes more than six hours of Zoom calls a day. The program did the best they could, considering the last-minute circumstances, but the internship became mind-numbing. Spending every day in my room was very lonely. Sometimes unbearable. The one instance I was not lonely that summer was at a protest held in front of Franklin High School. It was in response to the horrible police killings of innocent black people. That day, I was afraid. I was afraid for my community for the safety of my neighbors, friends, classmates, teachers. And I was angry. Angry that racism is built into the system that is meant to protect and not harm. Angry that guilty police never face any consequences. Along with these strong feelings, I was also feeling connected to my community. I saw that amidst COVID, it is still possible and at times extremely necessary for people to be together. I was reminded that there is unity in the fight for justice. So you're saying that I should just talk about the fandom first. Okay, okay. Okay. All right, so going off of the assumption that I will be using a self-insert for this, let's get that. All right. All right. Listen, going where we are in our modern era, in our modern era that we have built as a faniverse, that we are building as a faniverse. I don't even know what to say anymore. I mean, I could just talk about the faniverse. Of course I could just talk about the faniverse, but I don't want to. This is a public space with actual people who who is who care about me and they could just and Randy about the name of this train wreck that I've been working on for longer than I care to admit might you know change the way they think of me 
but honestly, honestly, honey, why do you even care about what they think of you? <sighs> why don't you just say it out loud? It's a private story and entirely localized to your specific headspace. It's not like they would even understand. And we've proven that time and time again. But, but what if they get curious? What if they care? And I, why am I so scared of letting other people know of, about what I care about? Why am I so scared about what I care about? Maybe that's because I know that I don't care about the kind of things I want to care about. But the thing is, the thing is, I could talk about so many other things. I got to go to a career aptitude test today. I could talk about how I want to be a screenwriter because, oh my God, wouldn't that just be so much easier to talk about? I mean, not even in, from an internal perspective. Wouldn't that just be so much easier to talk about? I guess this just goes back to the same few things about how the fandom verse, about the theories, about how the fandom verse is just about the struggle and love between both the drama and implications that we've been thinking about and working on for such a long time. Is the fandom verse toxic? And if so, can we fix it? Should we? really know the love and the dedication you have until you can't go outside of your house to do it or to see the people that you do it for. For a really long time during the summer, I really felt hopeless. Seeing my workplace that I valued so much, it was closed and yeah, not having a whole lot of work to do. That kind of left me stranded at home. And yeah, not having anywhere else to go and having to live in a place where the news is always on, that left me with a little internal panic. Seeing what was happening just a little bit north of me over in downtown with the violent protests, that really scared me. And not just because of what was happening over there. I was afraid that my neighbors in my community was afraid that they would take part in that. The Black Lives Matter movement has a really big impact on us here. It's almost like a role model. Oh 
my anxiety rose just a little bit more when I heard that there was going to be a Black Lives Matter march happening just down my street. The gun be like all the other ones? Will windows break? Will cars be beaten? A lot of these questions kept stirring in my mind. But as I saw the march happening just outside my window, I saw all my neighbors, friends, family. They were just protesting. There was cheering, singing, dancing. Is happening all just outside. So I was speechless and, and thrilled at the same time. So I put on my mask and I put on my BLM shirt and I joined in. I realized that I had nothing to worry about that day because everyone in my community feels the same way that I do. We all have that goal to stand up for each other, to love each other. Ever since that march, I didn't feel that feeling of doom looming over anymore. I felt hopeful again. Well, now don't get me wrong though, there were plenty of things to be stressed out about during last year's summer. There's a lot going on, to say the least. But that's why I'm really grateful for my South End community. Because even after everything that was happening, I still felt a little bit of hope. That little bit of hope felt like the world compared to the fear and the dullness that was happening just a couple months before that summer. The topic of police brutality was nothing new to me, or really anyone else for that matter. But the fact it took another person to be murdered by the police to draw attention to the matter as an issue it should be seen as is baffling to me. The idea that someone has to argue that their lives matter is saddening to me. It's just outright disgusting that people think it's something to debate about. Since I wasn't able to participate in protests, I mainly posted things on my social media and tried to have more conversations with people. Whenever there was something new that happened or things about injustice towards Black, Indigenous, people of color, I would make sure to post or repost things. Outside of the American protests during the summer, I was also paying a lot of attention to the things happening in Ethiopia. I am Ethiopian, more specifically Oromo, and in Ethiopia, the government is going through an ethnic cleansing of the Oromo people, which they still are. And at the time, my uncle, who went over for business reasons, was detained and held in prison with a lot of other political figures. This was all on account of COVID-19. The government would purposely expose them and other Oromo people to the virus and hold them in poor conditions. They would go around mass incarcerations, and executing people of all ages and classes. It didn't matter as long as they were Oromo. So along with trying to spread awareness about police brutality in America, I was also trying to bring some light and attention to the issues of the Oromo people and the things they are going through. The same as the Uyghur in China in the situation in Yemen. Overall, the summer of 2020 has been a very political and morally driven time for me and helped me understand what I believed in and what I wanted to see in humanity. It really helped cement my beliefs as a human being.
beaten on pike and fish. Fish places in one place in every way. Make all you want. Can't silence the truth in the name of freedom. End them. It seems their way from every sort of meat. Beats by sick society. So long ago, call the masses. Gases to read the green new deal. Steel preach, preach hypocrisy. Steel is all he ever said before he passed away. I think you should know that I think about you all the time. Whether the street lights are on or not. When the sirens and flashing lights drive by, name ends in I. I reach for my phone, I put it down, I pick it back up just in case and touch you high. You make me feel high, you give me a sense of life. I don't know what I would do if I was right. You should know that I hate that I care so much. You should know that I cry every night in my mind because I try, oh, I try to be light. But my world doesn't rain, it only gets dark. What a shame, what a shock. When I talk to you, I look into the window, I see the forest, the ocean, the sea. My heart beats fast for you, to you, like you. My breath gets faster, runs out. My body shakes and quakes from all the possibilities my mind makes. From all that has happened, whether it's the boys in rags or the boys with a bag. One, two, three, go. I miss hearing those words when I was young. Those were the words of excitement. Those were the words of laughter and happy screams. Those are the words of the past that I will never get back. Those are the words that I will one day tell my children and help them make the best memories possible to give them an amazing life better than mine. I wish nothing to happen to them, what has happened to me. Looking through the glass that separates me from the world and the bass in my head that only gets louder as if it's mimicking the glass in such a way you can only feel in your heart skips a beat, skipping through one word to the next but you have no idea what to do next year. I hope to become who I want and for this vast burden to go away and to stop looking through the glass but to be on the other side of it, looking in from the world. But where shall I start? Where the world has been taken over by the milk-skinned people. Where they have tried to strip us of where we came from but in the process have lost everything they have to the connection with the earth and has only made us stronger. Where they have stripped the world of its natural resources for spices they don't even know how to use. Sorry, but where we are now is undeniably because of them. And there you say I'm wrong, where the white man has put us without permission, pretending to be the friend but the foe after all. Where does this remind you of, you say? Why does this sound familiar to you, you ask? I don't think I even have to say it, and I don't think I'm the only one who thought the police should be helping us, not killing us because we need help, not killing us because of who we are, but what we are, what happened to protecting and serving. I guess something I learned about myself this last year is that I crave human interaction just about as much as I fear it. I like staying at home, but maybe I'd like to travel somewhere, maybe Japan or, or Korea. The cafes there are super cute. I would also love to go to Sweden. I feel like the air up there would feel really nice and crisp and I would really love it. I just want to see things and experience things. I would love to just travel with some friends, maybe even family, and learn about different cultures, eat a ton of food. I want to feel happy and free with less anxiety. Oh, I just thought of something I want to have in five years. This may sound materialistic, but I want a massive manga collection to flex on my siblings with. It's a childhood dream of mine to have a library amount of mangas. Maybe I could have a house since I'm dreaming big. And I'll have an entire room dedicated to my manga collection that is private. Only those who pass my vibe check can see it. Fuck yeah, that sounds so dope. Well, now I'm on a roll of daydreaming what could happen in five years. Oh, oh my gosh. 
I would love to have a giant house where my family and I could live together. I'm the fourth oldest out of 11, and since I'm 21, majority of my siblings would be underage, so we could live together. After the loss of two grandparents who live states away, as well as a significant chapter of my life ending and an even bigger chapter of my life beginning, all within the four suffocating walls of my bedroom, it is sometimes hard for me to see the good in this year. But living through this has taught me so much. It's shown me gratefulness, privilege, loss, family, love, growth, strength, and most importantly, that it is more than okay to ask for help. Five years from now, I will have graduated college, summa cum laude, of course, and by then, I will have moved to Arizona, where I will be passionately fighting for immigration and border justice. I want to start my own immigrant and refugee assistance program, as well as advocate for a more improved, humane immigration policy. I will also have my own theater company that produces amazing original plays. Five years from now, I'll be done with college, and if not in, then well on my way to New York City. Honk, out of the way, bud! I'll go with a group of like-minded friends I've made along the way. We'll find jobs, get an apartment. I'll find a night job somewhere so I can spend my days looking for a job, looking for work as an artist. Ideally, I'd find my way onto Broadway somehow. I'll meet people, I'll make impressions, I'll find meetings, programs, auditions, anything I have to. And one day, I'll get a part somewhere. I'll make the right impressions on the right people. And from there, the worst will be over. Every night, for weeks, I'll go out on stage, and I'll sing, and I'll dance, and I'll play, and express to everyone my love for performance. And then, I'll make my way into the realm of TV and movies. Like, hopefully, like uh, another Nathan Lane or Andrew Rannells. Two favorites of mine. So, I realized, change isn't the scariest thing in the world, because it's necessary. It's needed to become the best versions of ourselves, and to become greater than we already are. I guess that's part of being human. So with no limits, no roots to the earth, just what and where I want to be in five years, and honestly, I want to be running my own studio. I want to be running a small animation studio. Something with mm, 10, maybe 15 artists and animators. That way we can make what we want, when we want, and how we want to make it. Thank you for the whole world to listen.
Anyways, I mean, it's crazy, right? It is the nature of teenagers to be <sighs> confused about where they're going in life. But I'm fucking motivated. I like writing. And I like media studies. And I want to work in television and film when I grow up. Because, well, I don't exactly know why, but I don't really think I need a reason to like things. <sighs> and I mean, if there's one real thing I've learned over quarantine, it's that it's okay to be a little selfish as a creative type. And everyone, maybe somebody else could want the same story that you could that you want, but you're the one with the capacity and the ability to create that story, so you have to make it yourself. But I mean, that's the thing about being a writer-director, right? I mean, you have this vision, and you really love this vision, and you trust this vision, but as much as you think this vision might be perfect, your vision isn't done yet. So you take it through and you, and you take it through other people and other stages and uh, other people of like casting directors and other writers and actors who all have their differing visions for the project. And if everything goes well, which hopefully it will, not only will your original vision still be, at the very least, somewhat intact by the final piece, you will have made something so much better than you could have created by yourself because you had all of these other people and their visions suggesting ideas that you might not have even thought of yourself. Sadly, the corporations might have one of those visions, and that might not turn out too well for you. I mean, I could just talk more about the fandom verse, but I'm not going to. Y'all already know too much. Love. In five years, I want to know what it's like to love. I want to know what it's like to love a job. I want to know what it's like to love a house. I want to know what it's like to love being happy. I want to know what it's like to love him. I want to know what it's like to love life. I want to be able to love being free. I want to know what it's like to not be afraid. In five years, I will be 21. And all I hope to be is, now I know this might be reaching, so don't call me crazy, but alive. If I were to speak of my glories, it would be dishonest not to share the origin of my glories. It's love, her love, his love, and their love. If it weren't for the courage, compassion, and the power God gave to love, most of my origins wouldn't have been. It takes love to see the world with clarity. Oftentimes, we say life is beautiful when things are looking up. But keep in mind, life has always been beautiful. There's no denying that love comes more naturally to every living thing than hate. Love is ever so present. Love never leaves. Love never leaves. Most of my writings are now documented titles, yet undocumented to you.